Uh, we'll be starting our uh, our Bible class soon. Uh, good to see everyone here. Uh, before we start the Bible class, we'll sing a few hymns. Uh, the first hymn we'll be singing is hymn number 711, 711. And today we'll be having the men's and ladies class. And the men will be outside in the auditorium and the ladies will be in the cry room at the back. Hey, the first theme is Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. 711. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above before our Father's throne our our Lord and press our fears, our hopes, our aims, our one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes. Mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear when we are sundered. Gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. The next hymn is hymn number 738. <clears throat> Take the name of Jesus with you. <clears throat> Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of half. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of half. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of half Precious name, oh how sweet Hope of earth and joy of half Oh, the precious name of Jesus how it thrills our souls with joy When His loving arms receive us And His songs our tongues employ Precious name, 
O how sweet, O perfect and joy of heaven, precious name, O how sweet, O perfect and joy of heaven. <coughs> right, the next hymn is hymn number 410. In four one zero. <clears throat> and after this, we'll have the open prayer. <clears throat> He leadeth me, O oh, blessed thought, O oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whatever I do, wherever I be, still it is God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, He leadeth me, by His own hand He leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by His hand He leadeth me. Sometimes <coughs> deepest gloom, sometimes very dust bowers bloom. By water still, or trouble sea, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, He leadeth me, by His own hand He leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by His hand He leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory is won, in that cold wave I will not flee, since the heart to Jordan leads. Me. He leadeth me, He leadeth me, by His own hand He leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by His hand He Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our loving and merciful Father in heaven, we are grateful for you blessing us with uh, all that we need in our lives. And we know that you are the creator of all things and the provider of all things. And we know that all things come from you. And we ought to be grateful for all that we have in our lives and not take things for granted. We thank you for this time that we can all <clears throat> set aside from our lives to come together to this place that you have prepared for us to sing praises unto you, a fellowship with one another, and also to learn a portion of your word. Uh, Lord, we pray that you may be with the speakers later as they present uh, your word to us, that you may be able to share 
uh, your word in simplicity and in truth. The, so that uh, all of us uh, as listeners may be, may be able to understand your word. And Lord, we pray that you may help us all to learn well and reflect upon it and apply it to our lives so that we can continue to be uh, better servants in your kingdom. Uh, Lord, we leave the rest of the time into your hands and all this we pray and give thanks in the Son of Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Aldred, for leading the singing. Thank you. Um, good evening to everybody. And uh, yeah, so you're not so far away, so you can hear me okay from there. <clears throat> right, so uh, we're going to continue the month end study of Timothy, First Timothy. And uh, I know that Graham ended up at the uh, end of chapter four. So we'll be starting chapter five today. <clears throat> Um, just to recap, the, the first chapter was about false teachers, instructions about false teaching, and instructions in, on worship in chapter 2, and um, instructions for elders and deacons in chapter 3, and the fourth one is the warnings to Timothy and about abandoning, abandonment of the faith. Um, so let's just start off with a couple of easy questions really that's just to warm up I don't like this cold weather um, what nationality was Tim's father and what nationality was Tim's mother it's interesting that this it just shows in God's plan who he chooses to teach uh, the people and uh, his father is um, and was a Greek father and his mother was Jewish. So you're Jewish and Gentile mix there. So that's interesting and a good start, isn't it, for, for wanting to teach both Jewish and Gentiles the word. Another question, what did I have here? The, the name Timothy means, yes, also uh, honor, honor to God. And... Uh, that's again appropriate, especially when we study chapter 5, the honouring the widows, so uh, it's part of it. Um, another one is in chapter 1 of First Timothy, what was Paul's main concern? And I mean, I gave that away earlier on, and that would be the uh, prevalence of false teaching that was prevalent uh, in Ephesus. Um, <clears throat> In chapter 2, verse 5, it reads, For there is one God and one mediator and, and, and between God and men and the man, Christ Jesus. So the mediator being Christ Jesus. <clears throat> In chapter th 3, we have a question. It's written about, oh yeah, what is the... In chapter 3, it refers to Episcopus. That's the Greek. I know it's Graham's favorite is the Greek. And, and I know uh, Joseph is going to be fully conversant in Greek soon. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> and what does this refer to? So again, yes, there's a link to the uh, eldership and leadership and deacons. Uh, this, the ones who see over the needs of the flock. And a couple of other... Greek words were, sorry, I can't read it this side, yeah. Uh, poimen, those who shepherd the flock and tender the care. So, and the last one is oikomos, the stewards of God's flock, 
since they are designed by the church to be entrusted and with the needs of the church. And then lastly, in part of the chapter 4, in the last verse, 16, it reads as follows, Take heed to yourself and to the teaching. Continue in these things, for in doing this you will both save yourself and those who hear you. So the question is, what did Timothy need to take heed of there? And the answer is in verse verses one to four of chapter, sorry, one to three, chapter four. In the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding them to marry and commanding to abstain from foods. So that's what um, Graham ended up teaching last month. The the uh, deceitful spirits and teaching of demons, and also the commanding people to abstain from certain foods like pork and uh, so on. So, we all got 100% out of that, did you? And then we will continue in, in chapter 5. So, and then chapter 6, you'll see that the, it'll end in chapter 6 with instructions to those who minister. But uh, in chapter 5, we're only going to do uh, verses 1 to 16, which is regarding the widows, ministry of widows. Um, we'll just start that today. <clears throat> so, 1 Timothy chapter 5. The first verse, I'll just read the first verse. Paul, um, do not sharply rebuke an older man but rather appeal to him as a father to the younger men as brothers the older women as mothers and the younger men as sisters in all purity sorry what did i what did i say oh sorry <laughs> yeah. she, uh, thanks it's not it's me that needs to be warmed up, not you guys. <laughs> okay, so that younger woman as sisters in all purity. So let's have a look at that. Um, I, I think I'd go in straight just to start off with and look at Leviticus 19.32. Um, let's have a look at Leviticus 19.32. And I quite like this passage. Um, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. It's, you shall stand up before the grey head and honour the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God, I am the Lord. So it's just a reminder, folks. It's nobody else you've got grey hair. <laughs> so nobody else. Oh, well, there we are, it's a reminder. <laughs> okay, and also in Proverbs. <clears throat> that's, that's good, there was only me who's got the grey hair. Hmm. 16. So chapter 16, verse 11 also alludes to this. A just balance. Um, no, 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 no. Have I got that right? 31, sorry. 31. 16, 31. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. Okay, so that's to start off the lesson. Um, yeah, it's a uh, Two good passages. So we see there that it says, do not rebuke an older man in the beginning. Do not rebuke an older man. Paul directed Timothy that older men are generally not to be rebuked. A young teacher such as Timothy must shepherd them faithfully, but with due respect for the years and presumed wisdom of the older men. Now, what I found interesting here is that that particular word, rebuke there. It's the only word in Greek that is used there in the whole of the New Testament. And, and because you would think a rebuke is seemingly a, a strong word, isn't it? Well, it says here, do not rebuke, meaning that the Greek actually means literally to strike, to strike at. So it's quite an, 
an aggressive type action to strike at or I would say reprimand. So what Paul is saying here that is not to rebuke, to strike at and be aggressive in your, your rebuking of, of people. Um, so that, and we'll see further on that the other word in Greek for rebuke comes up in, first of all, in Titus chapter 2 verse 15. It says, uh, rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. So there the re- word rebuke is more a softer tone. It's uh, um, the, the actual, it's sort of, uh, it's, as it says in um, second, or first, second Timothy chapter 3, 16, it's more a softer rebuke. Let's have a look at Second Timothy three sixteen. We know this, and uh, it says all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for the teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It's more. It's a softer tone that what is Paul is talking about is that whilst you're going to rebuke somebody, it's not with an aggressive tone or uh, you are wrong, and it's a more a, a reasoning with that person as you get together with them to rebuke him or refute them and um, <clears throat> the command was not that Timothy must never rebuke older men as I say but that he was not to strike at people with an overly harsh rebuke So yes, the, the second one, the rebuke, is actually the word means uh, to expose or refute something or to show fault as you discuss with uh, the person concerned. And, and we know that no one likes to be rebuked, so, but the wise person uses the rebuke as a valuable means to growth. So people who are the wise ones will accept uh, being rebuked, knowing that it's for their good. Spurgeon wrote here that a sensible friend who will unsparingly criticize you from week to week will be a far greater blessing to you than a thousand undiscriminating admirers. If you have sense enough to bear his treatment and humble enough to be thankful for it. So there it's a case of being thankful for something being pointed out to you where you may have been incorrect uh, it's rather take it as a positive criticism. In verse 3, uh, it reads, Honor widows, as I mentioned earlier, who are really widows. Let's see what that means, honor widows. In the days the New Testament was written, there was no social assistance, social benefits, like a pension or something, from the government. In that day, there was one especially vulnerable class, elderly widows, who were usually without support from husbands or grown children and without means to adequately support themselves. These are those who are really widows. And we'll see further what the actual real widows or definition of real widows are. The meaning of one of the word to honor is to support or sustain and here it is most obviously being taken in this sense. As a commentary wrote, Clark wrote this, one meaning of word to honor is support, sustain, and here it is most obviously be, to be taken in that sense. So the principles revealed here are extremely relevant today. When many look to the local congregation as a place where the poor and the needy shall be able to come for financial help. And we see that, I mean, we've experienced it here at the church when people come to the door uh, um, asking for assistance. And just a thought, um, well, let me just go through this. Most of the churches, they can give many stories of people approaching them for help. And the church can tell you how hard it is to deal with these such situations with love because there's always this concept or the the love that we need to consider all when considering to help somebody 
but, that, but without being taken advantage of. So we, we see these people come in and then we don't know them from a bar of soap and we have to consider seriously whether we can help them financially or even provide them with something. <clears throat> and when asked to describe his or her favorite Bible verse, if you ask them, they're not able to give it to you. Uh, and any occasion where they, when helping those who are in need, they, um, we can say, well, do you belong to a church? If they say yes, and we say, okay, where? And they often can't answer that. So if this does happen, do we then help? What do you think? Do we assist those that uh, do come to the front door? Oh. It's a very difficult uh, situation. I mean, it's... Um, and, and the more I read here, I understand from my study that, no, we do not have to help because they're, um, <clears throat> they are not part of God's people. They are... They, uh, they uh, are not real widows or people that are qualify for the assistance. So, who are the real widows? Real widows were received, who are to receive honour. Um, that's further on in the verses. It, you'll see verses, I think, five and, and nine and ten. So, let's just look at a couple of verses here where an example is of um, a widow. And in chapter 1 to 2 of, sorry, in chapter 6 of one to, verses 1 to 2, we see and read about the Hellenists, Hellenists who complained that there wasn't enough assistance for the widows. They were being left uh, unattended. Um, if we look at Acts 6, verses 1 to 2, now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up the preaching, the word of God, to serve tables. So, yes, there was a, a manpower problem and... What was being overlooked is uh, that the widows were being left, um, being neglected. And in James chapter 1, verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. From the world. So this is under the, uh, the subject of hearing and doing the word. And this is part of hearing and then the action is to be supporting or helping widows. Ephesians 6, chapter 6, 1 to 2 is the relationship uh, of the children and the parents. Let's just go to the Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 1 to 2. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. So I mention those because you'll see further. It is to do with the widows and those also widows that have still children are not necessarily their priority. Their priority is those widows that do not have their children to support them. So in verses 4 to 6, um, let's just read verses 4 to 6. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. So here again, if any widow has children, as I've mentioned earlier, those who should be legitimately helped by the church should not have family who can assist them. If they have family to assist them, it is the responsibility of the family to, to, uh, to do it. So, and this passage describes real widows. Let's have a look at what the real widow is. As one who is left alone, she has no one else to support her, 
This shows the widows indeed are those that have neither children nor nephews, no relatives that either will or can help them, or no near relative that is alive. So we see that um, let them first learn to show piety or, or reverence uh, at home and to repay their parents reminds us of the ongoing responsibility adult children have towards their parents and grandparents. So again, I'm not so sure if it's in the Western world particularly, if that is in the back of minds of people here, that uh, it is their obligation to to help their mother or father who is now a widow. And, uh, but there it is, it's telling us that we need to be there for our mothers and fathers that are left alone or destitute. Trust in God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day. So we see that uh, a real widow is the one that trusts in God and continues in supplication and prayers each uh, night and day. Those who should be legitimately helped by the church should serve the church in some way. So here's one thing about a widow, and I'll go back to the question of whether we should help somebody just walking in the door. Well, we don't, not necessarily because of what we see here, that that widow should be someone who is in some way serving in the church, and the widows would be given the job of praying, uh, sorry, the widows would be given the job of praying for the church, but, but their service or their particular activity that they are involved in uh, should then qualify them as a real widow, in other words, serving in the church. <clears throat> and I'm not saying publicly praying, I see, um, in, in, the, in the church. But she who lives in pleasure, he has the opposite though, those who live in pleasure, as it mentions in that verse, um, those who should be um, legitimately helped by the church must have godly lives. So it is appropriate to say, you are not living as a godly life, so you won't receive financial assistance from the church. Well, that's, is that, I mean, that's quite a harsh uh, in instruction, I would say that, uh, it depends on each case, I, I would think. Um, is it appropriate? Well, we see um, an example of a, the real um, widow would be if we look at Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38, and see what Anna did. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2, verse 36 to 38. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then, <clears throat> and then at, as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshipping with the fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him in all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So a strong character who was really qualified as a, a real widow who would qualify for uh, assistance through the church. Uh, I wanted to look at also, um, let's look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. Um, and Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Um, you would think, why, why would I mention that? Because it says here in verse 6, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. What would you think? I mean, it's a case of uh, people were regarded as dead if they weren't following Jesus. Is that, is that correct? I mean, they were not part of the church, so immediately you would be um, not willing to assist if they were, uh, as she lives in pleasure and he's dead. 
So we would be reluctant to assist somebody of that nature. Um, <clears throat> In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. For anything that becomes visible in light, therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So, I mean, there's always this opportunity where people will wake up and become more followers of Jesus and then, and then would qualify. So there's always this possibility. And uh, that verse is saying, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. So, I mean, yeah, the, I would say another way of, of explaining that would be we're talking from an eternal point of view. Those people are dead to the, uh, not dead to the world, but dead to their eternal existence, who's of uh, not being part of, Jesus' teaching or accepting Jesus' teaching and following what he is, his instructions are. Verses 7 and 8, um, I'll just read those. And these things command that they may be blameless, but if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So here Paul again is reiterating the, the responsibility of, a, um, of the household, the head of the household, that he has a responsibility of looking after his family. And that would include the, uh, the mother and father and grandfather and grandmother. I mean, it's a case of having that responsibility throughout his life. So these things command, a good teacher will teach these things so that all will know what God expects of, him, of them. And he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. In the strongest term, Paul emphasized the responsibility of a man to provide for his family, to do all he could to support them. This is the minimum requirement of a Christian man if, it do, if he does not do even this, this, his conduct is worse than an unbeliever, as it says in that passage, worse than an unbeliever. That's quite, in, <laughs> quite serious. So part and parcel of, of helping uh, yeah, is that you, we assist the widows as who are part of the family before the church then gets approached to assist. In verses 9 and 10, a widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, and if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. So there's a lot more expansion of what the real widow is all about and what she would qualify if she was, uh, well, a case of the, the age. Um, it's even that specific, but I think it depends on each case that whether it would be would we turn somebody down at the age of 59. No, it's a case of I think we're just drawing a sort of a line and getting an idea of of uh, where and who we should be helping. But there again, it's uh, expanding on what the widow's uh, quality, good works are, uh, and she's also had the experience of bringing up children. Um, <clears throat> so do not let a widow under 60 years old. The idea is that if someone is under 60, they should still support themselves or get married. So there's this idea as well within this, is that what Paul is saying, that those that are younger still have the possible opportunity of getting married and therefore cannot be listed as, as a long-term 
a person being assisted in the long term, if they change in their circumstances, then we'd walk away from that and they, if they were remarried. <clears throat> so they would not be added to the list, support list. Um, and when Paul says that they should have brought up children, he probably had in mind not only raising of one's own children, but also those uh, abandoned children that was, well, it doesn't only happen in the ancient world, it happens the, now as well. <clears throat> Clark writes, uh, the words brought up may refer to the children of others who were educated in the Christian faith by pious, which is religiously devoted Christian women. And then also in what we've read, it says, well reported for good works. Their reputation, had, they had a good reputation. And if she diligently, the widow, followed every good work, those widows who were accepted into the support of the church must not only be true widows, but they must also have godly character. They were called to a job, not merely to, be, uh, to get a handout, but they were obviously called to serve as well or were willing to serve as well. Um, so we have a good example here, again, of another Christian woman. If we look at uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. It reads, Now there were, was a Joppa, there was in Joppa a d disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Don Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. So there, there was an example of her being uh, full of works and acts of charity. <clears throat> um, yeah, that was it. Just trying to think of something. That I wanted to say. Well, the word Tabitha or Dorcas means gazelle. So it was a, apparently that's for a, a pretty woman, not that uh, that did any, has any uh, relevant, uh, it isn't any uh, meaning here in this text or teaching. So verses 11 and 12 but refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. So refuse the younger widow. As a general rule, they were not to be added to the support of the local congregation because they generally could provide for themselves by getting married. <clears throat> and so they weren't to be left on the, the list of um, assistance list for widows. So here's an explanation of the, uh, well, the grow, grow wanton. Adam Clark on, on the idea of grow wanton. The word is supposed to be derived from to remove and the rain, remove and the rain, and it is, it is a metaphor taken from a pampered horse from whose mouth the rain has been removed so that there is nothing to check or confuse him. So the metaphor is plain enough and the application easy. So once the, things can go awry if uh, the, the horse is not in the rain. And similarly, the, the widows, the younger widows, uh, they can also leave the faith, uh, particularly if we, we look at the um, woman that We'll see uh, uh, later on that um, woman that marry outside the church or remarry outside the church particularly, those that were widows and remarry outside the church, Paul reiterates that that's a dangerous thing and they could leave the faith because of that or be in, enticed to leave the faith. <clears throat> So they desire to marry having, having condemnation. Paul did not condemn young widows for wanting to get married, only observing that many unmarried women are so hungry to, for marriage and companionship that they don't, 
conduct themselves in a godly way in regard to relationships. So here, yeah, that's, that's what could happen, the influence, the influence from the new husband. Many people get into a bad romance or spoil a friendship because they are desperately needy for relationship. It's a common occurrence that Paul warns of against, as we see, uh, the church of Ephesus possibly had problems like this with some younger widows who remarried after being enrolled to receive support from the church. I just want to look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. We see that Paul did not discourage remarrying, but if they were to get married again, it should only be in the Lord, as I mentioned earlier. So in 1 Corinthians 7, he mentions this or writes this. Verse 39. <clears throat> A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. There, it's quite clear there. Uh, and we know that equally yoked is, is the common phrase where we talk about it's best to marry somebody within the church. Because of the society in which... Uh, they lived in Ephesus. Paul was in fear that the younger widows might marry outside the Lord and, the, and be led into rejecting their commitment to Jesus. In verse 13, uh, it reads, At the same time, they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house, and not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, talking about things not in proper to mention, so again, referring to the wid widows that remarried, or, or, uh, yeah, they, uh, these young women who turned to unrighteous behaviour, became gossips among the church people, and they became sources of dissension, and possible re poss possibly resulting in unnecessary squabbling and disagreements, and yeah, gossiping, and obviously not helpful towards the church. Um, and we see, yes, in Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11, that was happening. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. So it certainly is, um, was a worry Paul with, for Paul, and he was warning Timothy about it, but I mean, it certainly is a case even today. And we know that all the supplies to out today uh, and what can happen. Um, so, it talks about a house to house. Since the early church met in homes of the members, the houses of the members became an opportunity for these type of women to go from house to house, speaking of those things they ought not to. <clears throat> One doesn't have to know, have to be a young widow to fulfil the description of what of they what they learn, how they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle but also uh, gossips and busybodies saying things which they ought not to. Those who spend much time talking about other people, uh, live live people's lives. Sorry, those who spend much time talking about people's lives uh, need to get get a life as we say it if uh, and Clark Clark wrote here in a commentary it is no sin in any case to marry bear children and take care of a family but it is a sin in every case to be idle persons gadders about g-a-d-d-e-r-s not sure and tatters busybodies sifting out and detailing family secrets so it isn't certainly what we want with idle widows. In verses 14 and 50, sorry, 14 to 16, we see, therefore I want younger widows to get married, writes Paul, bear children, keep house and give the, fa the, en the enemy no occasion for reproach. For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. And if any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, 
She must assist them and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. So this is interesting where Paul is encouraging them to get married and have children. And uh, certainly in order that they may be directed by their husbands. So if they are married, then uh, strictly speaking, their husbands are the headship and who they should follow. And he would guard against them falling away, hopefully. Their responsibility with children and home would keep them from idleness, leading to gossip, etc., etc. Some have already turned, as it says in uh, verse 15. Well, some of the women had already given themselves over to Satan, Paul writes. And he concluded that by encouraging all Christians, men or women, should continue to take care of those widows of their own households. This would make it possible for the church to care for those who were truly widows and those who fulfilled the qualifications, as we have written, uh, read in uh, verses 5, 9, and 10. It's just... Have a quick look at those, the qualities of the widow that qualifies. In verse 5, she who is truly a widow, left all alone, has, to set her, has set her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day. And another uh, verse, let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband. And again in, in verse 10, and having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has, de has cared for the afflicted and has devoted herself to every good work. <clears throat> Um, so that's all I have, but I, I wanted to just, um, yeah, on Sunday we're going to be looking at the rest of chapter 5. Um, I wanted to just give it some thought. Yeah, that's what I wanted to mention. I had experience just recently where, um, well, my daughter came and stayed for 10 days. And uh, when you when you think about why in God's plan or his instructions, the, the reason is that prefer younger people to uh, bring up children. It's a 24-7 job, I know. So, but it certainly is no idle time looking after children, which is, again, as I say, it's all the plan of the, the wife or having to look after children is her duty. Well, both of the, the parents' duty, but the the idleness that Paul is talking about here for younger, it does, it's a practical example. I noted that it's quite a busy job even just on one child. So I can understand that it's a, it's a, a, a plan. God's plan is, is always perfect. It's a case of it always works out if we, we, if we acknowledge all that's in the book, in the, in the word, it certainly is. There's a reason for it and a good reason for it, as we find out ourselves, even in our own lives. The last thing I have is, when I looked at rebuke, there was two different meanings for rebuke in, in uh, chapter uh, in 5, verses 1. The rebuke was different. It was more harsh than the, the rebuke in latter chapters like 520 and... Um, and in Titus. So I thought I'd look to see why is it widow and where's the widower? Yeah. So I thought maybe in all the in the Bible I looked and find a widow, well it means both. Well no, I didn't find that. And uh, and it made me think <laughs> um, as males yeah, is we, we will work until we drop. <laughs> Isn't that the case? <laughs> Is that the bad news? But I mean, it's a case of, I suppose in those days, the, it was they had to look after their families until they, they, they uh, died. Isn't it? I mean, 
there was no retirement plans there. There's no retirement planning. But uh, yeah, we, we, we accept as head of the house that you continue working to provide uh, all the time. And uh, I suppose, yes. And I thought, oh, no. That's, uh, in studying this, I thought, oh, where's the poor widower? Get a chance. But it isn't the case. It's a case of we work uh, all the time to provide. Has anybody got any comments about that? We, I, uh, no, nobody has some thoughts about it. But I think that's what the case is. It's a case of in the in those days the, they were drop dead in the in the fields working, and uh, that was it. And uh, no planning. Uh, maybe it's easier, really. You don't have to do any financial planning. You just continue and, and work to the end. So after that good news I've brought to everybody, <laughs> yeah, listening. Um, any other further questions? Any thoughts, comments? I think it's challenging uh, teaching for Christians in today's age because in a society, Western society, caring for your parents is not really, it's, it's relegated to the job of the government, the, the social... Oh yeah, social help, yeah. Uh, state like, or welfare, mm. uh, rather than the children's responsibility. Yeah. But, so, but still, it is God's work, it is God's will, that we should care. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. No, it, it makes sense. I mean, as I say, it just all falls into place. And uh, why not? We should be. We can't rely on any other help. It may, it may, it may fall away in the, in the future. So we, we then have a problem if we don't get the government help. Um, okay. Let's uh, close in the word of prayer. Almighty Father, as we uh, close today, we give thanks that we can gather together to, again, study your word and, again, give thought to the word that we've learned today and we study it and makes us realize that your wonderful book, your word, is the backbone of our lives and we, we give thanks for this and we give thanks that we can lean upon it and research and get the answers in your word and we are truly grateful for this and again we give thanks for our families and we give thanks for your providing for us that we may continue to help our families and support our families each and every day and we give thanks for this in Jesus name amen